Good morning, Epworth United Methodist Church and friends. Welcome to this, another remote worship service. I'm the Reverend Terry Cofiel, and together with the Reverend Bill Jones, we're going to lead you in a time of worship. Most of our announcements remain the same. We are not gathering for worship for the foreseeable future. We're waiting for a date from the governor who is instituting a phased-in worship schedule for churches. We'll let you know what that means as soon as we figure it out on this end. But we're looking forward to the day when we can gather again together, when we can celebrate communion together, when we can fellowship together in person. Until then, we praise God for the opportunity to be able to reach you remotely. We do want to remind you that the Margarita Griffith Scholarship Fund is receiving gifts now. We have quite a few students who are in need of help, and we thank you for those gifts that have already been sent in, and we pray that you would continue to send them in. We are so sad that we're not going to be able to do some of the mission projects that we'd hoped to do, but we're looking now at exploring ways of feeding our neighbors in the community through the school system and also by distributing gift baskets as we are able. So keep looking for information in your e-blasts. Keep looking for links to join our Zoom meetings, either our meetings for church work or our meetings for catching up, our meetings for prayer and study. Until then, we are going to worship the best as we're able, and we're going to begin this morning with our prelude. Good morning, Epworth family. Please join me in the call to worship, which comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Now please join us in our hymn of praise, hymn number 347, Spirit Song. Thank you. 
Amen. The fourth Sunday of Easter is always known as the Good Shepherd Sunday because we look at the stories of Jesus who is both the shepherd and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We're going to hear that familiar Psalm 23 in two ways this morning. First in our children's message and then, as it was intended, sung as a song. So we welcome again Debbie, Miss Debbie, who is going to present our children's message for the morning. Good morning, everyone. It's Miss Debbie. How was your week this week? I know it was another week. There, there's been 93 weeks, I think, that we've been home. But and I'm missing, missing you. I hope everybody is well and you're still in a, in a good frame of mind as we walk through all of these days together separately. Today, our story is about uh, a, more of a poem than a story. And it has to do with sheep. Have you ever taken care of an animal? Tell me, tell me what animals. Oh, that's a lot. I, I hear cats and dogs and goats and fish. I've had uh, a horse, but not in my house. <laughs> but today's story about is about the care and and comfort that we find in our Lord who takes care of us the way our, our friend David took care of his sheep. David is um, a shepherd. He plays music. He grew up to be a great king. And you know what? He's also in the family tree of Jesus. We're going to tell a story about how he feels about his Lord. Let's get started. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a good story. What a wonderful thing to know that no matter what happens in our lives, God is with us. The part of God the Father today in our story was played by God the Son. So for the older kids in the group, you know that Jesus hadn't been born yet, so his presence was the presence of God the Father in our story. But what a great, great thing to know that no matter what we find in life, that we'll be led and we'll be comforted and we'll be protected by Jesus, by our God. If you want to know more about David, look in the books of Samuel, 1 Samuel 16 and 17. It tells, tells lots of stories about David. David and Goliath, David and his friend, John, his friend Jonathan, um, the story of King Saul. There's so many things about David that we know. And throughout his whole life, David kept coming back to God, thankful for the love and care that he received from God, no matter what he did, no matter what he went through in life. How about if we all say a prayer, is everybody? Everybody's. All right, everybody's good? All right, fold your hands and we'll say a prayer. God of comfort, 
thank you for David, for his songs, for his poems. His thoughts are so clear and his experiences are the same as ours. He had a long life full of good things and bad things, but he still sings about his love and thankfulness for the care that you provided for him. Surely goodness and mercy are following us today and we have all that we need. May we keep those words in our hearts. In all of this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week, everyone. Take good care of yourselves. See you next time.
now it is time to see who is this morning's liturgist du jour. Our surprise guest is Alexa. Welcome to you this morning. Good morning. How are you doing in this crazy time of isolation? Discovering that retirement might not be so bad after all. Well, that's a good lesson to learn. Well, we welcome you this morning, and Alexa will be sharing with you our epistle lesson. Our epistle lesson this morning is uh, from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, verses 19 through 25. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Please join in in some way, if you can, in the prayer of the sheep. Like prophets, psalmists, and apostles of old, we know we are like sheep who benefit from your care and guidance. Even so, we go astray to follow false shepherds or go our own way. Yet you persist in seeking us out sacrificing all to bring us home. Without understanding why or how you can love us so much, we hear your voice calling and we come humble and thankful, ready with your help to become obedient sheep, listening to your voice above all others, following where you lead and trusting that in you all shall be well. Amen and amen. And thank you, Alexa. I want to give a shout out to Judy Sutter, who came in this week and put some photographs in the pews. Because last week I said it's so hard to preach to a camera. Now I have a two-dimensional congregation, but they're smiling, familiar faces. And it is good to see everyone this morning in even this limited way. This morning's gospel comes from the 10th chapter of John, the first 10 verses. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way as a thief and a bandit, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now you have to remember, even though I lived for 23 years in West Virginia, I am a suburban Baltimore County girl at heart. I don't know livestock. I know dogs and cats and parakeets. But livestock is a little bit beyond my realm of experience. So when I was in West Virginia, I was surrounded by animals all the time, and especially fields full of sheep. When you're a pastor, you're sort of drawn to the sheep image because the scriptures are 
filled with images of sheep. Us as the sheep, Jesus as the lamb, Jesus as the shepherd. And so in 2014 for Advent, the Baltimore Washington Conference Communications Commission asked me to prepare an Advent devotional for 26 days of lessons. And they asked me to write a prayer for each one based on words that we had come up together with during annual conference that year, words that we wrote on little bridges to talk about our unity with one another. And for these 26 words, I was asked to come up with a scripture lesson, a devotional, a prayer, and one of my original photographs. One of them was going to be of a sheep, and I thought this couldn't be any easier. So I went down the road where, just about a mile and a half from my house, was a huge field of sheep. I have a very long telephoto lens, and I was there getting ready to take a picture because they didn't come very close to me, and I was between the road and the fence and the field of sheep. And just as I was ready to snap the picture, along came a pickup truck full of teenage boys who decided when they got close to me that they were going to lay on the horn and scream. And the sheep tore off, and I almost fell on my behind in the mud. Well, I went out looking for another field of sheep, found that one, and as soon as I got close, they tore off. Reminded me of just a few years earlier when my youth group had made a film for Christmas. They were filming the story, and we were in a barn with cows, and then we were in a field full of sheep. And even though the woman who owned the sheep were, was there with us, they would not come close, and they were not exactly good on taking cues. As soon as the shepherds were supposed to get close to the sheep, Buford, the head sheep, I did not know that sheep have sort of elected officials, but Buford, the head sheep, tore off and everyone followed him into the woods, down a hill, rolling in the dirt. Wherever Buford went, they followed. And so as I continued to try to find pictures of sheep, I finally went on Facebook and said, please, all my urban and suburban friends, ignore this. I need a sheep. I need an up-close and personal picture of a sheep. To which my urban and suburban friends said, you have been in West Virginia too long. And some of them said, why don't you just Google a sheep image? But I needed an original picture, and someone from my congregation sent me a message that said, call my grandson because his cousins have sheep. And so I called him up, and he called his cousins who were in 4-H, and I went to the field of sheep. This is the photograph I took. This is Miss Paisley. She is really a beauty. Miss Paisley did not run because all we needed to do was to call to have her owner, her shepherdess, call, and Paisley came running. Reminded me immediately of the story that we read this morning. My sheep know my voice, and they come to me. I have to understand that in the ninth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus has healed a man born blind who could only listen for his voice. He didn't know what he looked like. He couldn't see him until he was healed. We remember on Easter morning how Jesus spoke Mary's name outside the tomb, and she recognized him. And how, although they were kept from recognizing him on the road to Emmaus, when they broke bread with him and they felt their hearts stirred within him at the sound of his voice, they finally recognized him. That is a good image, just as the image of sheep is a good one for us. Now, the picture of Miss Paisley looks pretty good, doesn't it? She's all spiffed up. She does not look like that, really. That was about an hour of Photoshop. She had stuff coming out of her nose and her ears and her mouth. Her wool was not soft and fluffy like the picture that we get in our mind of a lamb. Her wool was filled with burrs and pieces of twig and dirt and rocks and everything else that she had picked up along the way because she certainly did need a shepherd to care for her. We all need a shepherd to care for us because, as the epistle lesson said, we all, like sheep, have gone astray until we are called and returned to the shepherd and the guardian of our souls. Being with sheep the way I have leads me to think they don't just run astray, they run amok. They're going in every direction at one time. They will follow whoever the leader is, regardless of where that leader is taking them, until they hear the voice of the shepherd. And that is when they come to themselves and they follow. That's what we're called to do as Christ's disciples. We are called to listen for the voice above all others. There are so many voices crying out to us to do so many things that will lead us in so many directions that will take us far from Christ. But he is the true gate, the door, the open door, not a door that closes against others, not a door meant to keep people out, but a door meant to usher us in by the right way, 
to the place where God would have us be. We're living in a very difficult time, I know, and that's why we need to look a little bit about the epistle lesson this morning and its understanding of suffering, what suffering meant and what suffering does not mean. The suffering that we're talking about in the first epistle of Peter is suffering for the sake of righteousness, suffering for the sake of the gospel, suffering to stand up for Jesus Christ. Jesus does not want us to suffer randomly or intentionally, as some people have done before, to beat themselves to feel closer to God. The suffering is standing up for who Christ is in the world. It is certainly not, and please hear this, any sort of defense or commendation of slavery, which it was used as even in our own nation in the 19th century during the time of the Civil War. What the writer is telling us to do is to remember who we are in light of Jesus Christ and to follow him at all costs. So don't think about those slaveholders who said that God wants you to be happy where you are and to suffer for righteousness sake. No, in the time that this was written, slaves were forced sometimes to worship the gods of the household, the slave owner, and they would refuse to do so and they would be beaten for that. That's the kind of suffering we're talking about and certainly not the suffering for those who are ill, those who have cancer, those who are suffering from COVID because this is not the will of God. The will of God is wholeness, because Christ came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Now, I had another experience with a sheep in church. Now, you have to remember, I'm from the suburbs, so I would always call the Lang family, a shout out to the Langs of Hedgesville, West Virginia. I would call them because they were involved in 4-H, and their son Daniel, I met when he was a very young child and was able just a few years ago to officiate at his wedding. So Daniel and I go way back. Daniel's a good sport. In 4-H and in his life, he likes to raise milk cows. But upon occasion, I would call him up and say, Daniel, can you find me a donkey? And then Daniel, would you mind dressing like Jesus and riding the donkey through the streets of Hedgesville for Palm Sunday morning? He was a very good sport. His father said to me, one of these days later, you're going to have to get this lectionary of yours to match up with the real seasons of animals because there are no lambs at Christmas time for the manger. And I had always had a hard time for a live nativity coming up with a sheep because the sheep were mostly 4-H projects, the ones that were very portable, the ones that were used to being around people up close and personal. And most of the time they were expecting lambs. Lambs are born in late winter and very early spring. But I had the great idea that for a children's sermon on Good Shepherd Sunday, which that year fell in May, as it does this year, that I wanted a lamb. Now, you have to understand, lambs grow very quickly. And so Daniel, my old pal, comes in with a lamb. He has it around the legs. Daniel was a big guy. He was a farm kid. He was holding on to this lamb with all his might, and the lamb was nice and quiet until it turned around and it saw the congregation looking at it and went, Mah! I'm telling you, people fell off their pews. We had to take the poor thing outside because lambs are very vulnerable. They are very defenseless, except when they have the shepherd close by. One of the things that has broken my heart in these days of the pandemic and our response to it are the people who are protesting at state houses with guns often, wanting things to reopen. I want things to reopen too. I miss you all so desperately. I miss sharing communion with you. I cannot tell you how hard it is to be a shepherd, which is the definition of pastor, without a flock. But the thing that broke my heart the most was at one of the protests, someone holding up a sign that said, sacrifice the weak. Because for some folks, the idea of opening up businesses and opening up the community fully opening schools, opening churches. If that means that the older or more vulnerable people will die of the coronavirus, so be it. That is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ as it has been revealed and opened in my heart. Because Christ, who was the lamb without blemish, who was without sin, came and took upon himself in his vulnerability the sins of the world, the sins of me and you and the whole world. He took them upon himself so that he might be raised to new life and abundant life. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. 
He never said, sacrifice the weak. But he laid down his life so that we might have life abundant in this world and life eternal in the world to come. So as we wait these weeks out, as we wait to see what happens next, as we pray together for the curve to flatten, for people to be restored to health, for our community to be restored, as we wait to see if it means that we'll be worshiping with masks for a while or spread out in the pews, it might be a long time before we have a potluck supper or we're able to shake hands again. But until then, we trust in the shepherd. Listen for his voice above all others because he has come to give us abundant life. It's not always what we hope it will be. It's not always without pain or trial. But in our suffering, though Christ does not call us to a life of suffering, in suffering we meet him in an intimate way because God is never closer to us than when we cry out in need. So this morning, as we sing together, O oh Jesus, I have promised, O oh speak and make me listen, thou guardian of my soul. Know that the voice of God is whispering all around us if we just would listen. I invite you now to join in singing that great hymn, number 396 in the United Methodist Hymnal, O Jesus, I have promised. friends. This is a time in our service where we have the opportunity, even in this time of quarantine, even the, in this time of being separated, to lift one another up, our joys and our concerns, to be able to pray for one another. And uh, once again, we thank you for continuing to share these uh, with us 
Um, you hear a lot in the news and everywhere else everywhere else that we are in this together and we'll get through this together. Well, this is one of the ways uh, that we do that. So I'd like to be able to share the list of our joys and our concerns uh, for this day and ask that you be in prayer for your, your community. So the joys that we have are uh, from the first one from Barry Edwards. His sister Dawn has been cancer free for three months after several rounds of chemo and two surgeries. Wow, what a celebration. That is fantastic. We have been holding her in prayer and we're so thankful um, that she has received uh, healing and that she is doing better and will continue to pray as she uh, goes forward from here. Want to lift up Lee Falbel's mom who lives at the Masonic home. Uh, she has tested negative for the coronavirus a second time and was able to stay in the room she is used to, uh, used to being in. Prayers of thanksgiving for the good care she has been receiving. I also want to lift up my sister-in-law, Barb, uh, whose birthday, um, as I'm taping this, it's today, but as you're hearing this, it's yesterday. So uh, happy birthday to my sister-in-law, Barb. The concerns that we have for this week, um, Amelia, a friend of Diana Engler's brother-in-law, lost her husband unexpectedly this week. He was in his early 30s, and they had only been married for six months. So please pray for uh, Amelia and um, her husband's family uh, as they mourn this tragic loss. As for prayers for Lisa Sutton's cousin, Dale, um, who is also a distant cousin of mine, uh, who is battling cancer and is in his final days. The family of Ben Hoops, who is the brother-in-law of Lisa Sutton's son, Sean, he passed away after um, hitting his head in a fall. Uh, so please pray for the family of, of Ben Hoops. Uh, Gail and John McGuckin's friend, Phyllis, she has been in Northwest Hospital since March 28th. She had major surgery and now has an ileo ileostomy. Um, Gail McGuckin also lost her Uncle Harvey to congestive heart failure. Prayers for, for her um, Walther cousins. Uh, Walther, Walter is Gail's, Walther is Gail's maiden name. And Uncle Harvey's kids. Harvey was 89 years old. He was the best and last of the Walther uncles and will be sorely missed. Uh, Barry Edwards' brother Randy had major foot surgery uh, the first week of March and is doing well after that, but he is self-employed and money is not coming in. He is also awaiting results and guidance on testing for stomach pain as well as follow-up on removal um, of a carcinoma. So please keep him in prayer. Barry's other brother, Wayne, has distanced himself from the family. He seldom answers phone calls or texts and does not return messages. Um, we realize this is a difficult time for many people, so please pray for Wayne and uh, for Barry's family and for all those that are struggling and having a difficult time with quarantine. We also pray for Barry's job. Um, his center was due to close in June and Barry hoped he'd keep a virtual position in his current job. With the pandemic, plans and announcements about what is happening have been delayed, leaving Barry and Anita with a lot of an uncertainty. So please keep them in your prayers. Delene, a friend of Kara's, who was in the ICU with COVID-19, um, please pray for, for Delene. After three weeks, she finally came off the ventilator. So that is um, a, a joy, and that's a Thanksgiving, but she's not out of the woods. So please keep her in your prayers. Please pray for Bob Kofiel, who is facing multiple health issues at the moment. Uh, please pray for Jamaica Adams. Her father is not expected to live long. Um, he is in a nursing home in Baltimore. 
Please pray for uh, Ann Rogers, who has a procedure coming up. She is having difficulty swallowing. Please pray for Marvin, who suffered a brain injury during a fall, and for his family faced with the decision to discontinue his life support. And please pray for a former uh, Epworth member, Jack Boward, who is suffering from cancer and is in home hospice care in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, with his wife, Ruth. That's all the prayers that I have to share today. Uh, please continue to share them so we can be in prayer together for one another. Praying for and with one another is one of the ways that we will be able to survive all this isolation and separateness. And so we do encourage you, as Bill said, to continue to send us these concerns so we may lift them up together. I want to remind you that this evening at 7.30 there is a Zoom meeting. It's just a time to catch up and pray together and share together. So if you would like to connect to that, please see the uh, Zoom address that will be on the Facebook page as well as in your e-blast. It's been sent out to those who don't have computer access, so they can call in as well. But let us now enter into a time of prayer together. Holy God, holy and merciful, you are indeed the shepherd and the guardian of our souls, and we come to you now because we have gone off in so many directions. We don't know which way to turn some days. We are so worried, and so sometimes, like this morning, our needs and our worries our concerns outweigh our joy. Help us to proclaim always the joy of a shepherd who walks us through the darkest valley so that we don't have to fear, who is the gate flung wide so that we might go in and out and find pasture and abundant life, a new life, forgiveness of sins, and the power of your resurrecting love and transformation so that we might go into the world unafraid. For those names that we shared that break our hearts with their needs. Help us to reach out to them with words of love and comfort, of hope and peace, that we might be shepherds connected to the great shepherd, that we might look for others, that they might hear your voice coming through our words of compassion and caring, of love and kindness and invitation to grace, offered freely in your son's name. For all the concerns that we carry in our hearts, for those for whom no one ever prays by name, for all the things that we should be praising you for that we too often take for granted. We lift these before you now to your love, to your care, trusting that your will will be done through us or in spite of us when we come together and we beseech you as your son has taught us, praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have heard the familiar words of the 23rd Psalm today already. Now you're going to get a chance to sing them. Elaine is going to teach us a responsive way of singing the psalm, and we're going to ask that the congregation join in on the refrain. I'm going to play and sing it through twice with you so that you learn how to sing it, and then I'll start the whole song. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into
When I was in elementary school, before MYF, which was then Methodist Youth Fellowship, then United Methodist Youth Fellowship, there was an organization for kids called the Live Wires, and I was, believe it or not, a Live Wire. One of the things we were asked to do was to memorize our favorite passage of scripture. So I immediately went home and said to my mother, what is my favorite passage of scripture? And she said, of course, it's the 23rd Psalm. I memorized it, but I didn't know how to pronounce anointest or even what it meant, so I left that line out. Unfortunately, too often we associate the 23rd Psalm as the funeral psalm because it talks about being led through the valley of the shadow of death. I always tell people it's through. We don't have to stay there because we have a shepherd who leads us and who guides us, who will take us through to the other side. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. What a promise from God. What a promise from Christ. And we will go into the world that has no end. We will go into the gate eternal, and we will be with God our shepherd forever. I listen to a podcast every week for preachers, and one of the things that they remind us every time we get to Good Shepherd Sunday is although the word pastor means shepherd, that we're more like the sheep dogs. We work for the shepherd. We listen for that voice ourselves so that we know how to lead. That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for Bill and for all of us who serve as your pastors that we will always listen for that voice so that we might help you to hear it, hear your name, hear your call, and then help you to pick up and go and follow. Let that be your hope and your peace and your comfort and your joy and the blessings of God Almighty, who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen. Shepherd. 